you will recall the title of this, Developments in the EU Breaking. And when I suggested this title, I really thought that maybe the European Parliament will not pass uh, the von der Leyen Commission, but I was wrong. So not that not quite a lot is breaking, but not as much as I thought would be breaking, because I'm saying that. Um, and so I suppose you could say I cheated a bit. But anyway, uh, what I want to do is I, I will reveal uh, a trade secret. I'm in the middle of writing a book, a kind of non-customary book about the European Union. As you know, probably I spent 15 years as a member of the European Parliament. Um, my mandate ended at 9 a.m. on the 2nd of July, so since then I have been private citizen, Flynn. well, apart from one or two other things. And what, I, what I've been doing, what I've been spending my time doing, is it's, it's wonderful to have the time to think, uh, as distinct from rushing between Budapest and Brussels and Brussels and Budapest and Strasbourg and Tallinn and Berlin and Paris and heaven knows where else. And I've been trying to get my ideas together as to what exactly the European Union is from a kind of political, theoretical uh, perspective. Um, and my first proposition is that the European Union exists as a separate political entity. It's a polis. It doesn't really resemble any other kind of political entity. And maybe I'll come back to this. Um, ah, Sorry. end of martial music. Uh, so, okay, there's no military coup. <laughs> what a relief. So, uh, it, oh, fine, okay. Could I have it in euros for a year? <laughs> so, um, it, it's a political entity, and then the question arises why and what it's for and what it's doing and um, what's the purpose of having this political entity and what is its quality, what is its character and I'll come on to all of these but as I've argued before in this place and elsewhere the original purpose of bringing the European integration process together and we're going back to the very late 1940s was to ensure that there would never be another Franco-German war, and I think enlarging on that conflict resolution. If you look at Europe, um, it's a horribly complicated place with about 35 high cultures, with political power, or without enough political power. So conflicts, or to be precise, asymmetries of power are everywhere. How do you resolve this? Um, you can go with Clausewitz and say uh, war is just the extension of politics, or you can try to do it with non-violent methods through conflict resolution by consensus. And I won't go through the long history of the European Union. Lots of people have already done this. If I had to recommend a book, I'd probably suggest uh, Luc van Middelaar, Dutch. Uh, it's, it's in English. It's called Passage to Europe. My reading of Dutch is not good enough uh, to read the book. Um, he's pro-integrationist. Uh, he was actually advisor to the uh, President of the Council of Van Rompuy. But the book is good, um, even if I don't agree with his prior assumptions. So what you actually, what the, and I think this is a unique feature of political innovation if you think about it, how do you resolve conflict without violence consensually in a very complex area of asymmetrical power? Well, you know, in, in short, the answer is a large number of people, initially mostly men in suits, nowadays it's men and women, some of them in suits, sit round tables and try to come to some kind of a common denominator, which doesn't necessarily have to be the lowest common denominator, actually, um, although there's some indication that it's heading in that direction. Um, and 
my memory is that when I arrived in 2004 in Brussels, um, the watchword was soft power. And that's gone. Nobody talks about soft power anymore. And in a way, this is where I begin. Why has the word soft power and what's the, what's the consequence of this semiotic shift? I'll talk about semiotics a little in a while. Um, and when? Well, it's very difficult to, to date something precisely as to when it disappears. You can frequently say, oh, this thing happened on such and such a date, but it sort of vanishes. It's like, you know, the, um, the, the, the being that sort of disappears without your being fully aware of it. Um, I would say that the shift begins in the sort of 2010, but I'm not in any way dogmatic about the date, but it has certainly disappeared by 2014. So my last mandate from 2014-2019, it had gone. Um, and we no longer talk about soft power. In fact, I think if somebody had mentioned it, they would have looked at them very oddly, what is this soft power? It's really very strange. And I think this requires an explanation, which is what I'm going to try and do. What took its place? Well, in brief, what took its place is what I'm calling, indeed in this book that I'm writing, the punitive polis. The polis that disciplines its members. The, the polis that doesn't seek to find a consensual solution, but pressurizes not all, but some of its members. And where the asymmetries of power are not in some way evened out, but actually enhanced uh, so that we, a lot of writers now talk about the German hegemony in Europe. It's not a complete hegemony uh, in, in the way that, let's say, Gramsci uh, imagined it, but still, the fact that Germany at the moment is in the midst of a major political crisis means that there's a vacuum, there's a power gap, and the French are pushing, and the V4 countries are pushing to fill that gap. So what I'm, I'm getting at here is the discipline and punish in the very simple sense that Foucault used this term. Sanctions um, are now the primary instrument of governance, or at least, even if it's absent, it's not there in practice, it's, it's there in people's minds. I mean, I do remember several of my, several occasions when my colleagues um, and this particular committee was actually a very friendly committee, the Constitutional Affairs Committee of the European Parliament, would say, no, we have to punish these people. And I thought to myself, something's wrong here. This is not what I learned in my first two mandates, or certainly my first mandate. Um, and it's, it's starting from there that I realised that the European integration process, the European policy, was undergoing a shift. And then the question is, well, why? What's the explanation? Um, and here, I think, we have... This is where I'm going to bring in the semiotics. Um, I don't imagine many of you have uh, come across the work of uh, Yuri Lotman, who was uh, Russian, who worked in Tartu, which is now in Estonia, but he was actually from the place I'm going to call Leningrad, because where he was born, I think, was actually still called Petrograd, and then it became Leningrad, it's now St. Petersburg again. Um, and in the 1950s, he was effectively edged out, and his views were a little dangerous. Also, he was Jewish. Uh, so he was sent to Tartu, which everybody thought was the backwoods. If any of you have been to Estonia, don't tell the Tartu people that they're the backwoods. They don't take kindly to it. Um, and he, and Lotman then started thinking of His own field was language literature and comparative literature. Uh, and he started thinking about exactly what, how to approach uh, the study of literature. Um, and cutting the long story short, he developed a particular approach in semiotics. Um, much of his work is available in English. Much of his work is available in Hungarian. But nobody knows. Uh, I mean, this is part of the great mysteries, which is, takes me in a different area. Why is it that certain areas, certain ideas, 
are simply not received into another culture. One very good example of this is it took about 15 years for Foucault to be accepted in Germany. You need transmission mechanisms, and it seems to me that with semiotics, outside the semioticians, nobody really pays much attention to it. Um, I do remember one of my uh, students many years ago was uh, working in social linguistics. I said to her, tell me, why is it that here you are, social linguistics, why don't you read semiotics? The two disciplines are really not that far from each other. And she looks at me as if I had said something, go back to the other side of the moon or something. The idea of these two disciplines having something to say to each other was simply alien. But it seems to me that one could use one or two of Lotman's ideas. I mean, the book, which is last published, book, which Lotman published in Hungarian, after his death, he died in 92, a huge number of manuscripts were found, uh, located in various places. So they are still being published. But the last book published in his own lifetime is called Culture and Explosion. It's available in English, Kulturoish uh, Robbanash, available in Hungarian, available in Russian. I haven't checked any, obviously Estonian. I don't know about French and German or other languages, but may well be. It's not a long book. Basically, Lotman's idea is that we should always examine social processes relationally, not in isolation. There are always two actors, or maybe even more, but certainly two actors who come into contact, and in certain circumstances, what emerges from that is what he calls an explosion, or what I could call a crisis, uh, or lots of other words, lots of similar words. Uh, which convey the same idea. Basically, what we're looking at in the context of the European Union is the coming, if you like, of three, and then maybe two more, explosions, for which the European Union, the European policy, the institutional structure, was simply unready. And here I'll just offer you a throwaway line. Why was the European policy not ready. Well, it's a pre-globalization institution. Its foundations were laid in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and then continuously thereafter. Um, and pretty theoretically, the assumption was that causation is linear. If you throw an egg at a wall, it will break 100% of the time. Uh, if you boil water, it boils at 100 degrees at sea level, always, invariably. And this is the classic uh, assumption about causation, that one particular move always has the same outcome. Now, what we're having with globalization is that this is no longer true. We're now having processes like um, that are so-called emergent processes, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, read up about it, it's quite interesting. Or that classically, uh, whatever you begin with, the outcome will not be any larger. Uh, but this is no longer true. You can have, this is the butterfly effect. Small causes large effects. The classic, by the way, um, you all know the keyboard, the, the QWERTY keyboard, the one that's here in front of me. It's actually very difficult to use. It's counterintuitive. And the reason that um, it's set up in this way, except for the French, of course, who have their own keyboard, the Azerty, drives you mad trying to use it. Um, but most European languages, not Cyrillic, obviously, or Greek. I never looked at a <coughs> Greek typewriter. Um, the early typewriters were very slow, and the typists were too efficient. So the keys got stuck. So they designed a new keyboard to slow the typists down. So from this small beginning, you have the universality of the QWERTY keyboard. But by now, you have the technology, the digital technology, that would be much faster if there were some other more efficient keyboard. But we're stuck with the QWERTY. Uh, I don't know whether there was any thought given to this in the 1970s or even 60s 
when the first computers started to uh, be built, whether they should switch the keyboard, but they didn't. So you have this rather small beginning, of, if you like, a pragmatic solution to a short-term problem, and we're stuck with the outcome, which there's nothing we can do about it, which is actually a non-efficient keyboard, but life is like that. But it gives you an idea of how globalization works, the, the butterfly effect. So what are my, my deep crises? Well, the first one, actually, is enlargement. The European Union is really not ready for the arrival of 10 new members, eight of them former communist states. It did not have the cultural capital. It assumed that, oh, well, these countries, you know, they've been through the pre-accession process. They'll just fit in. And I think to some degree, they were misled by the 95 enlargement of uh, Sweden, Finland, and Austria, which went very smoothly, on the whole. Um, so our arrival was a shock. <laughs> it was also a shock for us, let me add, because it became very clear that ugh, these new members, we were new members for many, many years, and I remember my colleague, Thomas Deutsch, saying, you know, a pair of shoes is not new after nine years, but a member state is, and why should that be? Anyway, so we were, if you like, apprentice Europeans. There was a certain sense of cultural, political, obviously economic superiority, um, and we didn't fit in in the way in which the European Union institutions expected. We wanted different things. And I'll give you one example of this. You remember the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Um, the Poles took the lead. And there was a lot of disgruntlement, French and Spanish MEPs saying, who are these Poles? They've only just become members of the European Union. I mean, why are, the Poles, why are they being so pushy? The answer to which, of course, is they actually knew quite a lot about Ukraine. And that was an argument that did not go down terribly well. Uh, so if that's the first shock, absorbing eight common, former communist countries plus Malta Cyprus, um, which raised separate but not very significant problems, partly because they're both very small. The two countries together have a population of uh, less than two million. Malta subsequently has become a problem, but we can leave that to one side. And Cyprus, of course, does have the problem of being a divided island, but leave that to one side. So that's 2004. The next crisis, a year later, the French and Dutch referenda on the constitution project. There was a project to have a constitution for the European Union, and the French voters and the Dutch voters said no, by quite telling majorities. I think it was 61% in the case of the Netherlands and 54% in the case of France. Is that right? Something like that. So basically, two of the founding countries of the European Union, uh, Council Community, Common Market, so on, were saying no to further enlargement, to, further, to some extent to further enlargement, but certainly further integration. It was a shock. Um, and I remember the elite in Brussels was sort of speechless. And finally, the then president of the commission, uh, Barroso, said, we'll have a year of reflection. But nothing ever came out of that reflection, I hasten to add. Um, for me, that was a key moment when I realized, not immediately, it took a little while, that, wait a minute, further integration, the deepening, it does not have popular legitimacy. At which point I started to ask, it was not a popular question to ask, can you integrate further without sufficient popular support? What about the citizens? You know, the European Union is forever going on, the European citizens. But actually, um, when the citizens say no, the European Union is most displeased because the European Union's view of the world is that more integration is inherently good. Um, in 2007, so the second half of the year, the Portuguese had the presidency, and at the end of the Portuguese presidency, the then Portuguese Prime Minister, José Socrates, 
um, gave a speech. President, you know, the head of government will always make a speech at the end of the presidency, and he used this sentence. Democracy is Europe's DNA. And I thought, brilliant. What a wonderful metaphor. And I thought, hats off. And then I thought, well, hats off to a speechwriter anyway. And then I started to think, well, wait a minute. I mean, can you have democracy in which the voters don't really play a role, a democracy without a demos? And I thought, wait a minute. This is not how I understood democracy, but it was not a very popular view. Be that as it may, um, the answer to the French and Dutch referendum was, we'll ignore it. So, you know, the Lisbon Treaty is born, Treaty on the European Union, a technocratic treaty, if you like, um, and everything went ahead. It sort of shadows the, the constitutional project, but much, not much, but certain important things that are in the constitutional treaty are omitted. And then the third crisis is which I won't dwell on, is the 2008 economic crisis, which is the classic globalization crisis, various things impacting on Europe from all sorts of places unexpectedly, obviously the United States, subprime and so on. Um, and to some degree, we're still in that. Uh, the growth levels uh, in the Eurozone have been pretty minimal for about 10 years. Um, countries outside the Eurozone have actually done rather better, which is a separate story. But people in the Eurozone don't like to be told that the successful countries of Poland or Hungary, Romania, um, doesn't go down well, to be reminded. This is then followed by the migration crisis of 2015, and then I would say the 2019 crisis, which is just sort of acquiring shape, the identification of, of global warming, or climate change. It's sort of there, bubbling away, if that's the right term. Um, but I think only now has it acquired political significance. So basically, if you put all these together, you have a reason why soft power is abandoned, uh, there's a reappraisal, um, and the European Union's leadership, which is partly Brussels, but also partly also the capitals, it's always an interplay, Capitals in this particular case, above all Berlin and Paris, move away without ever saying that they're moving away, but they do move away. Um, and you can see the, the, the early trial runs with Italy and Greece. Again, at the time, this is not the way I lived it. I thought, oh, well, this is a pragmatic solution to a problem. Um, Italy really had a total unbelievable and unpredictable prime minister in the person of Berlusconi, um, who I did meet once. Luckily, I couldn't talk to him because my Italian doesn't exist. I can just about read a menu, but I can't have a conversation. Um, so the French and Germans said, we're going to get rid of Berlusconi. Will, you know, the Italian debt is really getting out of hand. This endangers the Eurozone. Oh, we'll find a safe pair of hands, Mario Monti, a technocrat, former Italian commissioner, terribly nice man, I have met him. Um, and we basically overthrew Berlusconi and imposed a government on a democratic state without the voters actually having a voice. This is very dubious if you think about it, uh, if you believe in democracy. And well, the answer, of course, is that the next time there are elections, uh, the, the Eurosceptic Lega Nord does very well, the somewhat less Eurosceptic, but still Eurosceptic, five-star movement, they form a government, well, that doesn't last, and it's Italy in a permanent crisis. So, in a way, imposing a technocratic government or a democracy doesn't bring you the rewards that you think it should reward. I won't go into the Greek crisis, it's not an exact parallel, but again, there's a standoff, and the European Union in, in tries to impose certain things in Greece, and uh, cities are collapsed, basically, and accepting this. Furthermore, I'll keep going for about another five minutes with your permission. Um, a further factor in this is have a punitive policy, the central instrument of which is the rule of law. 
reference to Article 2 of the treaty. Now, I don't imagine that you go to bed with a treaty on the European Union under your pillow, uh, but you must have come across reference to Article 2. Uh, I have spent a great deal of time with Article 2, and it is on my telephone. I don't put it under my pillow. Um, basically, this lists a series of desirable things in the European Union, the first of which, by the way, is not rule of law, but human dignity. Absolutely ignored. Um, so this rule of law is the central instrument for governing the European Union, and you hear this now all the time. Um, I think it was picked up above all by the rule of law commissioner, uh, Franz Timmermans, was actually vice Dutch commissioner, vice president, with whom I had a number of engagements. Um, and furthermore, in this process of making the rule of, law, rule of law central to the governance of the European Union, power is increasingly outsourced to the court. Um, I'm not among those who says unelected judges, but nevertheless the accountability of the legal sphere is very weak. And you may say this is a good thing, we shouldn't have judges to be too accountable, but what happens when you politicise the judiciary? you have a judiciary that loses its legitimacy. Um, and that, I think, is beginning to happen. Um, there's no outcome. It's still in process. The, the next thing I want to mention is... It's a long story, but again, I'm just going to give you a, uh, a very short account of it, is the dominant element of the left from about the mid-90s onward, is liberalism. It's not the liberalism, if you like, of John Stuart Mill or Tocqueville or even Isaiah Berlin. Um, it's a different kind of liberalism, um, which is much less tolerant, um, much more into what Zygmunt Bauman called moral legislation. Uh, and the fascinating thing for me is that this liberalism merges with the federalist approach to integration. That integration is inherently good, it's inherently liberal, um, and should be pursued. And that, I think, is the mindset of probably the majority, but certainly a very significant minority in Brussels and indeed in several of the capitals. Um, so, the question I posed at the outset of, of what is this European Union, well, there's a line of argument which I think is gathering strength, is that it's a liberal empire. Now, I don't know how these two words can be put together. It's like hot ice. If it's an empire, it can't be liberal. If, and so on. But, you know, how can you have democratic accountability in an empire? The answer is you can't. And there's an old uh, veteran social democrat, Wolfgang Streeck, German, uh, who has an article published like this year or last year called The Doomed Liberal Empire. He doesn't actually quite see laid out why it's doomed, but anyway, the article's worth reading. Um, some of you will know the Polish think tank, you know, the Battery Foundation. Um, they published a paper in, two years ago, I think, called uh, an, an Empire of Liberal Values. And I thought to myself, something very funny going on here. It's the discourse of empire in a state, Poland, which has been repeatedly overrun by empires. If you know your history, you will know that Poland was subjected to four partitions by different empires. We in Hungary have also had several empires. I don't have to tell you about the Ottoman Empire and Kuseg and so on. Um, so there we are. Uh, it's not, I think, fully an empire. Um, it's... At this particular time, you can either say it's a hybrid, it's a cop-out, or you can say it's, it's sui generis, which is also a cop-out. But it's very difficult to... It's not a state, it's not a republic, it's not a commonwealth. 
it's quite easy to say what it's not. It's very difficult to say what exactly it is. And partly this is because it's changing all the time. There is innovation, uh, and I've no idea what the outcome of that will be. So I would suggest if you're interested in developments in the European Union, watch this space. Thank you for your attention.